Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and in this video I'm going to build this T17E2 Staghound Anti-Air Armoured Car. This is a 48th scale model from Bronco, and it's the first Bronco kit that I've ever built, so going into this I wasn't really sure what to expect. Spoilers, I mostly enjoyed the kit, but you are going to hear the word fiddly quite a lot in this video. I'm not sure what the red dot in the bottom left is cautioning us of, but being careful with this kit is pretty good advice. Let's have a quick look at what's inside the box. Sprues, that's what's in the box. These are all quite nice and neatly moulded, which I guess is always a good sign when you're opening something from a manufacturer that you've never seen anything from. The detailing is nice and sharp, and I was unable to find any obvious defects or errors. There are of course mould lines, even the best plastic kits have some mould lines. These are very minor, and I didn't have to spend a whole lot of time cleaning them up. Some of the smaller parts were a bit more tricky to remove mould lines from because, well, they're small. Fortunately, it wasn't a huge issue because the mould lines are so minimal. Speaking of small details, there are quite a few of them in this kit, and I will admit that some of them were a little bit frustrating to deal with because of their size. You will notice that there was a couple that escaped my grip and disappeared into the gaping maw of the carpet monster. It's unfortunate, but sometimes it happens. Really though, it isn't too bad, and those small parts really do add a lot of nice detail that may not otherwise be moulded into the larger parts. At least the parts that I didn't lose anyway. I'm obviously not an expert on staghounds, and I will demonstrate that through this video. What that means is I can't tell you how historically accurate or inaccurate this kit is, but I can tell you that it goes together rather well and it does look the part. I would say that it's pretty accurate. Here we can see some string, which is intended as a towing cable, though I didn't use that so we won't be seeing that in this build. There's also some rubber bullet belts, which are very similar to the dreaded rubber band tracks. On the other side of that little baggie we find the decals. I've obviously never used Bronco decals before, having never built any of their kits, but these look fine, and I'm sure they'll do the trick. You get markings for what seem to be two variants of the vehicle, and I'm kind of amused by the one that says Great Aunty Aircraft 4. Obviously it works a bit better if you've got an American accent and you say Aunty as Aunty, but at least in my mind it's a bit funnier if you say Aunty. And Photo Etch. Certainly not Herbert's favourite thing, but it exists, so here it is. Some of this is annoying and small and kind of fiddly to bend, but some of it really adds to the model, so I can't complain too much. The instructions are, of course, included, which really does make the build a lot easier than if we had to guess where everything goes. The instructions are okay, and they're broken down into relatively simple steps, which when you're building something that can get a bit fiddly is, I feel, kind of important. You don't want to get overwhelmed with having too many things to do at once. You want the correct amount of whelm. Not too much, not too little. Some of the diagrams were a bit confusing, and unfortunately that did lead to mistakes. Part of that is my fault for being old and crap and tired and misunderstanding the instructions, so I would recommend looking at the instructions thoroughly. There are two marking guides. Option 1 is the Royal Canadian Dragoons in Italy 1944, and option 3, 11th Hussars in Normandy, June 1944. Option 1 and 3. Maybe there's an option 2 that I'm missing somewhere. Maybe it's a typo. The last page is blank, probably so that you can do some nice little drawings or practice writing swear words. And that's what's in the box. How about we glue some plastic together? I feel like it makes sense to start with the hull, and the instructions tell us to do that, so I do that. I start by gluing the sides on, which is pretty simple. These are shaped such that it's really easy to get them together at the correct angle. You may have to apply a little bit of pressure, but that shouldn't be too much of a challenge. I add a bit of extra glue to the insides of the joints, just to let the parts know I'm serious about them staying together. The lower front plate goes on next, and this seems like it should go on the front. The lower portion of the front, maybe. And then the rear plate. So far, all of these parts have pretty much just dropped right into place, which is just the way I like it. But how about something fiddly? You know, for fun. This very small ring thing needs to be attached to this thing. I kajigger it into place and then add glue. 
It's not actually that difficult, but obviously you should be careful when doing this. It would be pretty easy to lose this part. This assembly actually requires two of the tiny little rings, and the instructions, unsurprisingly, will show you where they go. There are four of these assemblies in total. I set those aside and add one of these suspension related doodads at the front of the hull on either side. Then I add a small thing to that previous thing I just installed. You'll probably notice at this point that I don't know what any of these parts are called. What matters is I think I've got them in the correct place. Then a couple of, I guess you might call them mounts, for the rear leaf springs. I glue these in place like so. It's pretty simple. Another part which I don't know the name of goes here. There's one of these on either side. Then I install the little assemblies that I set aside before, the ones with the incredibly tiny rings on them. There's one of these for the front and rear on both sides, in slightly different positions to each other. Then why not some leaf springs for the rear suspension? There is obviously one of these for either side, and the parts are identical. The way you can tell which way around they should go is there's a small loop on the top, just behind the central axle holding part of the leaf spring. That loop should go toward the rear on both sides. Now for some axially differentially doodattery. This one is for the rear, and as you can see, the main part comes as two pieces, and it goes together nice and easily. Then onto this chunk, I glue this small thing. Those two assemblies are then glued together, which is pretty easy. They're shaped in such a way that you will have to put some effort into it if you want to do it wrong. Assembly of the front axle is pretty much exactly the same, though the parts are clearly different. Once the main parts are together, there's additional bits to add, and this is one of them. These two pieces that probably have names like Carl and Bob go together like so. They're keyed, so again, you can't get it wrong unless you really try. This will hold the front wheels on. It would make sense that it goes onto the end of the axle thing. There's a little nubbin that protrudes from these, and those nubbins should be on the same side as that box thing in the centre of the axle. I follow this with a couple of square platey things that go on top of the wheel holding doovers. There is some keying, and I think I got these on properly, but the instructions weren't actually super clear to me. There are similar pieces that go on the underside of the wheel holdy things. As I write this I'm referring to the instructions, and it looks as though I actually missed a piece. Oh, big surprise there, Herbert! There should be a little crank looking thing on the side of the wheelie thing. Probably part of the steering mechanism, if I were to guess. I'm sure I'll be receiving an angry letter from the International Staghoundologists Association. Anyway, I add this steering rod thing, and it just gets glued onto the little nubbins that I mentioned earlier. This is why they have to be on that side. Next, I add this little platey thing to the bottom of the forward leaf springs. There's a little bit of keying on these that I may have trimmed off on the leaf spring, but that's okay. You can line up the tops of the bolts on the plate with the rest of the bolt on the sides of the leaf spring part. Having axles is well and good, but they won't be of much value unless we put them on the car. There's a drive shaft for each axle, and they are both different lengths so don't mix them up, unless you want badly fitting parts, I guess. The rear axle isn't too difficult to place, though you may have to do a bit of lateral nudging to make sure that it isn't all wibbly wobbly. I found the one on the front to be a little bit more fiddly. You install the drive shaft and axle, but you don't glue that in. The leaf springs go over the top of that, and I suppose you could glue the leaf springs to the axle, but I feel like doing it the way that I did was a bit easier, and there's less risk of misalignment this way. When the leaf springs are in place, I glue the axley bits to them, so that it's sitting on the leaf springs rather than being stuck to the hull. Let's add a few more fiddly bits. I add this thing, which looks like a mount of some sort, and it more or less just drops right into place. Then I add this thing here. This is definitely the incorrect position for these. The instructions do look like they're pointing here, but in reality they're pointing a fraction of a millimetre behind this on the diagram. It wasn't until I was looking at another later instruction that I noticed this was wrong. I thought you said fiddly, Herbert! I did, so let's do this. This thin rod goes in here. There are little guide knobs for this, and you'll find tweezers to be kind of helpful here. Then I join these two bars together. I found it easier to do this than to try and glue them together in position on the model. 
that assembly can then go into place here. It is obviously kind of fiddly, but it's not the hardest thing in the world to do. There are more fiddly little rods and things at the front, which does make sense. There's all kinds of steering doodaddery going on there. It's not exactly the same on both sides, but it's quite similar, so I'm not going to make this needlessly long and go into too much depth with it. Moving on, I glue a couple of mufflers together. There are guide pins, and it's pretty easy to get these together nice and neat. Once that's done, the end part goes into place. Then I press a little platey thing onto the curved exhaust pipe part. This should stay here with friction, and it can be glued later. And by later, I mean now, once it's been pressed into place on the muffler. It's a good idea to test fit on the whole rear plate to make sure that you've got all of this lined up. There is a second muffler, and you should probably put that together as well. You don't have to, but the next thing I did was to glue them onto said rear hull plate, just so that all of these bits stay together. There is a little, I don't know, stowage holder that goes between the two mufflers. It does look as though it should have a lid, but it doesn't seem to have a lid, so it doesn't get a lid, I guess. To finish the rear plate, I add the final exhaust pipe bits to the mufflers, the bit where the exhaust comes out. These have a curve to them, and they should be angled such that the exhaust would be exhausted straight rearward. I figured it might be a good idea to wait until the engine bay doors are in place before installing that plate, so I set it aside while I assembled the engine bay doors. There isn't much to this, you've just got to stick on a couple of handles. The first one is relatively thick, but it has some tiny, what look like butterfly nuts? <laughs> nuts. So try not to break those. The other one is a bit thinner, so don't break that either. In fact, don't break anything. And just like that, we've got two nice engine bay doors. We can't really install them though, because the upper hull part needs to be there first, otherwise they're just going to fall in. So I glue that into place. This is well before the instructions say to do that, but I'm a rebel. I do what I want. The part mostly just drops into place, but the little framey bits at the rear for the engine bay doors are a bit bent, and it doesn't want to sit neatly in place by itself. I convince it with some pressure, and obviously a bit of glue. The plastic here is thin and small enough that while there is a bit of tension, it doesn't take too much to hold it nicely in place. Next, instead of installing the doors, I add this rod thing. It's probably a tool of some sort. It goes here just behind these vents. Then, this cover goes over said vents. It's not really keyed, but the vent bits make this really easy to get into the right spot. Pretty much all you've got to do is plop it on and add glue. I follow that with this little, I assume, vision device. Whatever it is, it's pretty simple to get into place. Viewing hatches for the driver, and I guess co-driver, or maybe commander, come next. These aren't especially tricky to put together, at least if you're modelling them closed like I am. If you do wish to model them open, there are a couple of other bits that you'll need to add, but since I'm not doing that, it doesn't really make sense for me to show you, because I didn't do it. To allow the crew to see when the front hatches are closed, there's some vision devices, which go into the forward roof plate part, whatever you might call that. These are clear plastic, which I guess is kind of nice, but you'd have to be painting as you build for them to be useful, and I'm not doing that, so I'll just glue them in and paint over them. The parts do pretty much just drop right into place, though do make sure that you've got them around the right way, otherwise your crew won't be able to see forward, and the other crews will point and laugh. On top of the clear plastic parts, we add these little caps, which I assume are to block the hole when the vision device is removed. You can see how it might be annoying to leave these off until painting time, just to make use of the clearness of the plastic. Next, I went to install the front plates, and noticed I'd missed a drilling instruction on the staghound's left side. Ideally, this would have been done before gluing the whole sides on. I decided to use a trick and I have done this before in a recent video. I just take a sharpie or any other black marker, and I mark the recess where I'm meant to drill. Then, with most plastics, but especially light-coloured plastic like this, you should be able to see the black mark through the plastic, and then drill a hole in the right place. It is a simple trick, but it can really save your ass. And now, I can install that upper plate with the vision devices. And the fit is really good, as with most of the parts in this kit. I follow that with the uppermost front plate, I guess you might call it. This and the previous part are being installed well ahead of when the instructions say to. 
but what are they going to do? Stop me? Ha, huh, I've already done it. The instructions also say to glue these two upper plates together well before installing them, but it's significantly easier to get them at the correct angle if you just glue them straight to the hull. Then I install the little hatches. These are both the same, so it doesn't really matter which side you put them on, as long as they're on. I skipped ahead in the instructions again just a little bit because of reasons. I add these little support bar things to the rear of the hull here. I feel like these might be a little bit less than visible, so if you really wanted to, you could just omit them. I won't tell the police. Really though, they're not that hard to install. Though I will say, I wasn't quite sure what angle they should be sitting at. I used the rear plate, the one I installed mufflers on earlier, to figure it out, because there's mounting holes for them. I glue it all together and make sure there aren't any horrible gaps. A little step backwards in the instructions and it's now time to add tools and other doodattery to the sides of the hull, like this thing. Also the antenna. The antenna is the reason we drilled that hole in the side of the hull before, but wouldn't you know it, the antenna mount didn't have a guide pin. We can probably never be sure if I inadvertently clipped that off while not paying enough attention, or if it never had one. Initially I was going to model this in the down position, but then I realised it might be kind of annoying to try and get the little photo etch bracket thing lined up with it. To make things slightly easier for myself, I moved it to the up position. I add a couple of tools to the left rear, like a pickaxe and a shovel, and it's pretty easy to figure out their positioning. I found it a little bit harder to determine how this thing, whatever it is, should be attached. I'm sure the Staghound Enjoyers Foundation will be very mad that I don't know exactly where this important piece of equipment goes. Next, I install that little photo etch bracket, I guess you might call it, the antenna holder that I mentioned just before. The instructions do show a couple of lines where this should be mounted, but I couldn't see those on the plastic, so I just positioned it in such a way that it looks like the antenna should just rotate down and into it. I continue adding tools, this time on the hull's right side, and this time, instead of the whatever it is, I had some trouble figuring out the correct positioning of the axe. I think I've got it close enough though. Moving on, it seemed like now was an appropriate time for wheels. The front and rear wheels are slightly different, though the inner part is identical for all of them. The, I guess you might call them the internal components, are also different for the front and rear wheels. The rear wheels have a little thing with a square axle dova. You insert that through the opening in the back half of the wheel and then glue the two halves of the wheel together. The front is a bit different. There's a ring that should go inside the wheel and then interact with the axle when that's inserted into the wheel. It didn't seem to have a decent way to stay centred though, so I just omitted it and then glued the two halves of the wheel together. It doesn't seem to have made too much of a difference. Instead of installing the wheels, I add these little hinge parts for the engine bay doors. There are two of these on either side and keying to guide them. It's not a bad idea to use the door to test fit these before the glue has set. And then, why not glue those engine bay doors into place? Sounds like a fun few seconds to me. At first I was a bit concerned that they seemed to sit on top of the rear plate. I just figured they should sit against it so that you can't see the edge of the doors, if that makes sense. It seems my assumptions were incorrect, and this is the way they're meant to be installed. Next, I add some teeny tiny latch things to the engine bay doors. The instructions seem to want these so that the wing bits, I don't know what you'd call them, are across the doors and I assume that's the locked position. They didn't really seem to fit very well that way, so I positioned them lengthwise. It could be that someone is getting ready to open the engine bay doors. Anyway, now seemed like a really good time to add wheels. Really? Yeah, wheelie. The front and rear wheels are obviously different in the way they mount, and it's pretty easy to not mix them up. It's also quite simple to put them on. There is a tiny bit of play in them, so you may have to do a bit of nudging to get them nice and straight, but I'm sure you can deal with that. Next, a jerry can. This is comprised of four parts and it goes together pretty easily, though obviously the handle and cap are a little bit fiddly because they are quite small, but it ended up looking pretty good. Jerry cans are well and good, but they don't hold that much fuel, certainly not enough for this staghound anyway. So I glue together a pair of fuel barrels. The end of the barrel with the hole, where you would add and remove liquids, is keyed so that it only goes on in a particular way. 
the other end doesn't have any keying and it doesn't matter which way it goes on, as long as the outside is not on the inside. On the holy end of the barrel, I add some very tiny bits of doodaddery. I'm not sure if I've got these on in exactly the right way, mostly the what I'm assuming is a tap handle thing. I follow that with doors, and there's one of these for each side, you might be surprised to learn. There's enough detail on the insides of these doors that, if you wanted, you could model them open. In fact, if you are going to be doing this, there is a bit of detail that should be glued onto the insides of the doors. I didn't do that myself, because I'm modelling them closed. There's no hull interior, so I think it's just going to look better with them closed. It's pretty obvious that there's no interior, when you can see in through that big opening in the front of the hull. And lucky for us, there's a part specifically designed to cover that up. This front plate part, which pretty much just drops right into place, just how I like it. I then put together the box thingies that will go on the sides of the hull. The first one went together with no problem, but the second one was a bit deformed. The box part had been kind of bent somehow, and was wider than it should be, which is obviously a problem. I roughly bent the part back into shape and used glue and pressure to get the assembly together. I'm not sure if all the kits are like this, I think it's more likely to just be mine. Next, it's time for an antenna mount, and would you be surprised to learn that I missed a drilling instruction? No, that wouldn't really be surprising, would it? To deal with that this time, I just trimmed the guide pin off the bottom of the antenna mount and glued it roughly where it looks like it should go. I know, the Staghound Accuracy Association are going to be angry. I attach the side box thingies next. There's a couple of guide pins to help here, and it's nice and easy. There are some photo etch mud flaps for, well, for the mud guards, and these aren't the most difficult things to stick to the model, but I did find it kind of tricky to get them on at the appropriate angle, and I just didn't really like how they were looking. They are optional parts, so I just pulled them off. You do need to drill a hole in the rear left mud guard if you want to attach that jerry can we put together before, and I do, so I did that. And why not follow that by gluing said jerry can into place? Installing those mud guards is the next thing, and just for fun, I'm installing these ones at the front here incorrectly. I'm sure this will also upset the Staghound Accuracy Association. The instructions were a little bit unclear here, and they kind of made it look like the mud guard should go on top of the plate, where the opposite is true. The rear ones didn't have that problem, and while they were slightly fiddly to put on, they did go on with pretty much no issue. I continued adding stuff, like these things, Whatever these are, they go on the sides, above the box things. Then, while I was trying to figure out how some photo etch is meant to go on, I realised my mistake with the front mud guards. So, in a fit of rage, I tore them off. Okay, so it wasn't really a fit of rage, and fortunately, the glue wasn't totally bonded yet, so it was pretty easy to pull these off. Removing and replacing these into the correct position did leave a bit of a mess, but that wasn't too difficult to clean up. I just let the gluey mess dry, then scraped it back with my knife and gave it a bit of a sanding. It's probably not perfect, but it could obviously be worse. And with that properly in place, let's move on to some photo etch. Not the photo etch for the front of the hull that made me realise my mistake, instead it's straps for the fuel tanks. These don't have any indication of where you're supposed to bend them on the photo etch itself, but the idea is that you bend the ends over so they form the metal reinforced ends for the fuel barrel straps. Once the ends are folded over, I use the fuel barrels as a kind of guide to get the straps bent to, if not exactly the right shape, close enough to it. I then super glue the little plastic shackle thingies into place, and there's a different one of these for each end of the strap, so try not to get them mixed up. I set those aside to bond, then it's time for the photo etch at the front. These things, which I had to bend at a 90 degree angle, they're a bit rough looking because I don't have a fancy photo etch tool and am generally incompetent, but they're good enough. These sort of things probably take a bit of a beating anyway. Here I'm bending a very small bracket that goes between the hull and the back part of the front mud guards. There's one of these for either side, and it was kind of annoying and fiddly to get into place, but it's on, and that's enough for me. I decided that it was time for a break from the photo etch and super glue, so I glued the, I don't know what you would call it, turret ring thing that goes over the original turret ring. We need this because the anti-air turret is a bit smaller than the original turret. 
there's a bit of text on the part, and it should be facing toward the front of the hull. At this point, I realised I'd placed these duvers in the wrong spot, so I used a bit of glue to unbond them and replace them in the correct location. This is because I saw a more clear diagram in the instructions while I was putting something else on. I follow this by installing the fuel drums. The drums themselves are pretty simple to install, they more or less just plop right into place. The tap thingies on the ends of the barrels should face toward the rear. While that was bonding, I installed a pair of tail lights. The light itself is pretty fiddly on account of it being so small. Over the top of these, I add some covers. I then add these little, I guess they're shackles, and they go around the sides of the hinges for the engine bay doors. Nothing too tricky here. The straps for the fuel drums come next, and I was pretty happy that these had plastic ends. The way I did these was to glue the top sections of the straps into place, making sure they're around the right way, then letting them bond for a while so they would be nice and strong to take the tension of kajiggering the lower end of the strap into place. There's not a lot of tension here, but it is enough that you have to hold the straps there for a short while while the glue takes hold. Now more photo etch. This part has a jig, though the jig wasn't very big. I glued a bit of sprue to it to give it a bit of a handle, which did make things a little bit easier. This jig is used to bend some brush guards for the headlamps, and the handle did make it slightly easier to use, but it was still pretty fiddly and annoying. It would have been kind of nice if there was a way to know for sure if you had the piece of photo etch centred before you started bending. At any rate, I got the parts bent into something resembling the shape needed. We can't install those until the headlamps are on, so why not install those? This isn't especially difficult, and they do come with clear lenses, but I think I'll keep those aside until painting time. I'm sure that makes sense. Then, with a good amount of swearing and grumbling, I get the photo etch brush guards into place. This wasn't really fun, at least not for me. The instructions do say to put these on before attaching the lights to the hull, but it seemed to me like it would be a lot easier to do them with them on the hull, so that's what I did. To me, the brush guards look a little bit tall, and it does look kind of rough, but they're on, so I move on, and install some little bracket things here on the lower front hull. This is pretty simple. If you're building the kit exactly as the instructions say, there's going to be a towing cable that connects here and runs up and over the front plate. I've chosen to omit that, but there are some retaining clips that go on the front of the hull, and even though I won't be using the cable, it does make sense to put those on. These are very small, which unsurprisingly is going to make them a bit fiddly. There was also meant to be a tiny little lamp on each mudguard. Unfortunately, the carpet monster, that scoundrel, was able to eat one, so I felt like it didn't make sense to put the other one on. I'm sure you understand. The Staghound Accuracy Association does not understand. Nuts to them. Here's the shackles that should hold the towing cables. If you do want to add the towing cable, you'll need to put the cable end parts into the middle of the shackle before gluing it onto the bracket. There are some similar brackets at the rear of the hull, and those parts have a kind of eye-shaped keying, which makes it very easy to install them correctly. I follow this with shackles for the rear. These go on in pretty much exactly the same way as the ones on the front, which is nice and easy. There is also meant to be a couple of photo etch bits on the hull rear, a couple of bars that do something, I guess. I completely forgot about them. Yes, yes, send your angry comments. I didn't care all that much because I was way too excited for it to be turret time, which if you look at your clock, you'll see that's what the time is right now. I start by gluing these two thingy doovers together. There are two of these, and they're both slightly different so don't mix them up. Then I put the guns into the little holder things like so. My guns were very slightly bent, which isn't really ideal. I applied a little bending pressure, and that did help a little bit. Now for some more fiddliness. Hooray! This little bar goes onto this thing, and this will be part of the ammo belt feeding system, which probably has a better name, known only to people who are not me. I then super glue on a bit of photo etch, which I bent into more or less the correct shape, but didn't film for whatever reason. It was slightly annoying to bend, but surprisingly, it almost drops right into place. I set that aside, then I install the gun into this, I don't know what you might call it, a mounting. 
I used tweezers to apply pressure and push the little ring things together, because if I didn't, I felt like I was going to break something, and that seems like a bad thing. This is the point where you'll be determining which angle your guns are aiming at. I've chosen to aim them pretty much horizontal, because I'm imagining my staghound is going to be parked and not currently actively fighting. The instructions seem to want you to choose between that and roughly 45 degrees, but I say do whatever angle pleases you the most. Before putting the other side of the mounting or whatever it's called on, I add this piece of photo etch, and there is a bit of a recess for it to sit in, though I'm still not sure I got it in at exactly the right position. Then I glue that half of the mounting thing on. It is slightly fiddly, and it would have been nice if there was some keying, but it's not the hardest thing in the world to do. I follow that by gluing on this little ammo feeding thing, the thing I just put together before. There's a little bit of keying on the sides of the guns for these, which does help. There are also some little rubbery belts of ammo, but I chose not to put those on. Now it's time to join the two gun mounts together. This assembly is part of what will hold it all together. It was easy enough to figure out how these two parts go together, though I had a bit more difficulty with this bit that goes on the rear. The difficulty being looking at the instructions and being certain that I understood what it meant because the angle the diagram shows has this part on the far side, which isn't really helpful. I assume I got it right in the end, but a little bit of clarity would have been nice too. Next, there's some very small bar things that sort of link together, and I think I put them together at the correct angle. Then I glue a larger chunk of central thing to one of the guns. This whole joining the guns together malarkey was pretty fiddly, and a lot of the bits are small, thin, and flimsy, which really is not the worst thing in the world, and it is the price we pay for fine detail. I glue one pair of the assembled bar things to the end of this bar. Yes, very words, Herbert. Obviously I haven't got the technical names for these things, but you can sort of see what I'm doing, and it goes together like so. The bar parts are meant to come into contact with the round part of the gun holder things, and there is meant to be a microscopic bit of photo etch on the end where that contact occurs. I've omitted that to avoid driving myself batshit insane. Eventually, I kajigged the other gun mount onto the other side of this assembly, and it's obviously not perfect. I didn't feel as though I could apply enough pressure to this without breaking it, but I did my best to get it nice, neat and straight. The instructions wanted the gun sights to be added at this point, but I figured it would be really annoying to try and do so, so I left it for later, and then began adding details to the inside of the turret wall parts. This was a nice change from the tiny fiddly gun bits. There's various boxes and doodads to glue onto the inside of the turret walls, and it's pretty easy to figure out where each bit should go. I didn't really clean up any of the lift rings that go on the outside of the turret until after everything was on because they were too tiny to hold in my fat fingers to neaten them up, and it's a bit easier to do that when they're on the model. While I was putting the second wall part together, I noticed I'd installed the forward, I don't know what it is, some sort of plate or deflector shield, whatever it is, I'd put the first one on a little bit low, so I added some glue to loosen the bond a bit and forced it upwards into the correct position. I told the viewers on stream that nobody would ever know, but now you know too. Don't tell anybody. The rear wall goes together just as easily as the side ones, and there's not a whole lot to say about that, so I might as well move on to the turret floor. Well, not really the floor, the bit of the turret the guns and side parts will attach to. Yeah, that's the technical term for that thing. I glue this thing, whatever it is, into a little tab back here. I follow that with these little curved mounts. These are for the gun sight mechanism, and it's probably not a bad idea to have them bonded into place now so they don't move when I try to glue stuff to them later on. Then, it's time to put the gun assembly into the turret ring doodad. For some reason, I was kind of expecting this to just drop into place, but it didn't. It was hard to get this just to sit in the turret bottom part, and even harder to get it to do so with the guns facing forward and not all splayed out towards either side. It took a bit of kajiggering and nervously applying pressure. Because it seemed like it was going to break, I did this in two stages. I glued the right hand side in as best I could, and then I left it to bond. While that was happening, I glued together the gunner's seat, or at least the main components of it. 
It isn't too difficult, and there is another part, but I felt like it was better to leave what we've got here to bond for a bit before putting that on. After that, I kajigged the left half of the gun assembly into place. I did clip back a couple of bits of doodattery at the front of this, so that it would all fit. I don't think that's going to be noticeable, and it's preferable to have things fitting, than not fitting. It might be a bit easier to do this if you test fit the gun assembly in the turret bottom as you're putting it together, and obviously, I didn't do that. The result is that my guns are definitely not perfect, but they are together, and in place, and neat enough for me. I follow this by adding what seem to be boxes of ammo into the turret basket. These are pretty simple to put in, though the turret basket sides did attempt to make it a bit more difficult. I refuse to let them stop me though. Then I put the butt holding part of the gunner's seat onto the assembly we assembled earlier, and then we can glue that into the rest of the turret basket. This here is the part the gun sight will be attached to, and there is meant to be a very, very small thing attached to the end, which I did try to attach, but the carpet monster struck again. The carpet monster is a right bastard. Anyway, I glue the sight mount onto this brackety arm thingy. This is not the way the instructions want it done, but it made more sense to me to do it this way. I've put the gun sight on at what looks to be the correct angle, and then I glue that onto the mount in the turret. I follow that by adding the other arm thing to the other side. It's a little bit fiddly, but not too difficult to do this, and I do try my best to have the gun sight mounted as straight as I can. You might be surprised to learn that this is kind of delicate, so before I add more to it, I let it bond while I add the turret basket. This goes together pretty easily as you might imagine, though definitely make sure the turret basket is pressed in far enough at the sides, otherwise it may not fit into its mounting hole. And then it's time for some more fiddly little bars. These go between the bracket on the sight mounting arm things, and connect with the round things on the gun mounts. There is meant to be another itty bitty piece of photo etch here, but again, I've avoided the irritation of trying to attach it for my own sanity. If you did want to build this exactly as the instructions say, these thin bars that I just installed would be all that held the gun sight parts in place until you put the gun assembly into the turret bottom part. I think it's pretty easy and understandable to see why I did it the way I did. I'm confident in doing this, I've avoided possibly build ending frustration. Contrary to what some people will tell you, you don't always have to follow the instructions precisely. Sometimes you just have to read ahead and think about things, and use your model as intuition, which is a thing that probably exists. People who write instructions are flawed just like everybody else, and sometimes they get it wrong. Anyway, now it's time to add the protective elements of the turret. The gun shield at the front is pretty simple to get into place, thanks to the keying. It's a good sign that the guns don't interfere with it. If you built the model perfectly that probably shouldn't be a concern, but with the trouble I had getting the guns into the turret bottom part, I was slightly worried about it. I then glue the turret sides on. There's some big, well, relatively big, chonky keying that makes this nice and simple to do. The only problem was I didn't feel like I could apply much pressure when trying to deal with positioning and making sure there were no gaps between the sections of turret side. That's all pretty easy, so let's get back to the fun fiddly bits. There are two, I guess you might call them support bars, that run from the gun shield to the rear of the turret. It was surprisingly quite simple to attach these, you've just got to be careful not to knock the gun sight equipment out of place. Speaking of gun sight, why not add that now? The sight is a piece of photo etch, and while it is small, it's not the smallest thing, so it's not too bad, and it was pretty easy to get into place or at least what looks to be close enough to the right place. Then, why not one final annoyance? Installing this bar across the top of the turret. To be fair, this wasn't a big annoyance, just a minor one. I wasn't really sure if this was meant to go over or under the site, but I decided that over the top made a bit more sense. I'm pretty sure this is a support for a canvas cover, so I'm assuming this gets removed before the gun is used, and therefore won't obstruct the sight by being over the top of it. It makes sense to me. If this is wrong, I'm sure it won't hurt to add one more crime to my already extensive list of crimes. And if you don't hear from me again, you'll know that the Staghound Accuracy Association has finally got me. Anyway, there is one last thing to do, and that's mount the turret to the hull. 
There's no locking tab mechanisms or anything like that for this, but the turret basket should help hold it in place. That seems like it should be sufficient for most occasions. It will almost certainly fall out if you turn it upside down, so probably don't do that. The T-17E2 Staghound, anti-air armoured car in 48th scale, from Bronco Models, is complete. And, well, I'm pretty happy with the final result, I do think it looks rather good, and it's a very nicely detailed model. There are definitely some bits that aren't perfectly straight or in the right spot, and I obviously omitted some of the parts, so there's bound to be some dingling who's all like, a blah, 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 you suck at models, or something like that and they're obviously entitled to their opinions. I think the result is pretty good, despite all of the missing bits, and if you hold it at arm's length, you don't really miss anything anyway. That is usually the way I build my models. If they look good at arm's length, that's great. If they look good closer up, that's also great. I do prefer to maintain what little sanity I've got left, rather than mess around with the incredibly small and fiddly bits of photo etch sometimes. The bits in the gun sight mechanism, for example. Also, I would really prefer not to spend half a week trying to find the almost microscopic parts that went flying and became snacks for the carpet monster. As much as I am loathe to feed that bastard, sometimes it just gets away with the parts. It's part of the circle of life. On the build streams for this, I theorise that maybe this vehicle has arrived in a depot or something and is being used for spare parts. The first parts removed being the siren and the little cylinder thing that was meant to be on the back of the gun sight, and maybe the canvas cover that should be on top of it. It is fun to come up with stories like that, and it could lead to ideas for things like a small diorama. It's either that or the reality, which is, parts got lost, didn't care that much. Anyway, I did, overall, enjoy building this model, or I wouldn't have finished it. But I do have to admit, and it was probably kind of obvious on the streams, there were a handful of times where it was almost more annoying than it was worth. I don't really mind the tiny, small, fiddly parts, but sometimes you are just not in the mood for that kind of thing. While building this, I did, at least a couple of times, say that I kind of regretted choosing the anti-air version of this vehicle. And there are options with the regular turret. In fairness, it was kind of an impulse purchase, and I'm pretty sure I only bought it to meet a free shipping threshold. Another annoyance, though not only specific to this kit, but it was the fact that some of the instruction diagrams were a little bit unclear. I do often say this, but it would have been a bit better if some of the diagrams were at different angles, or had more little pop-out things that show an alternate angle for the instruction, or what the parts should look like when they're together. Not all the mistakes I made in this build were caused by the instructions, of course, but a lot of them were. Obviously, sometimes I'm just bad, and I'm certainly not an expert on any vehicle, so I don't have an intimate knowledge of where everything should go off the top of my head. I'm sure the members of the Staghound Accuracy Association do, but I'm not one of those. That said, I feel like this is a pretty accurate model of one of these Staghounds, and if you're looking for a good, well-detailed display model of one, you could probably do a lot worse. If you're someone who absolutely loves tiny fiddly parts, and spending a lot of time getting said tiny bits perfectly placed, this is probably something you'll enjoy. If that's something you hate, maybe avoid this kit. It is a good kit, but like anything, it can never be perfect for everybody. The quality of the kit is pretty good. There were a couple of parts that were kind of bent, but nothing extreme and I'm pretty sure the damage I had in my kit isn't common to all of them. Most of the parts went together with little or no issue. Well, little to no issue that was the fault of the kit is probably a better way to say that. I didn't have to do a whole lot of cleanup and mold line removal, though obviously there was some. This was the first Bronco kit that I'd ever built, and I didn't really know what to expect going into it, but I am pleased. Maybe not with some of the tiny fiddly parts, but I'm happy with the end result and I did enjoy the build. That's probably enough waffling from me. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to put them in the comment section below. If you want to watch me build kits like this one live on stream, and laugh as I struggle with tiny parts, check out my Twitch channel. The link is in the description below. And if you haven't already done so, why not subscribe here on YouTube? 
it costs nothing and it's probably pretty good. Or maybe if you've got the means and you want to help the Herbert Herbert up do Herbert Herbert up things and see my videos a bit early before there's any ads, consider becoming a patron. You can find links to Patreon and all of my other things like Discord and social media in the description below. I'll be back soon, so until then, take care of yourselves, be excellent to each other, and if you've made it this far, thank you for watching. Farewell.